raptured before the tribulation, before the wrath, before the outpouring of God's wrath. I'm so thankful. Just like he rescued Lot before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, was destroyed. And just like he rescued Noah before he flooded the earth, he's going to rescue you and me before he pours out his wrath on this wicked earth. That excites me and that moves me to gratitude and thanksgiving. Amen? So he will be back on Wednesday. So uh, praise the Lord. He's being a blessing. And God's rocking that city. Family Harvest Church Seminole. What a blessing Todd and Daphne are. Oh, I forgot to give my offering. I was just caught up in the moment. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. I've got a, a fresh word from you. I always think one of these days, Lord, I'm going to get to go back over the multitude of sermons I've preached in the past and make them better, you know. <laughs> but he always gives me something that is just stirring in my heart, so I have to get in there and pull it out and organize it and write it. But you know what? It's a fresh word, and I believe it's going to be a word in due season for many, many of you. Amen? So go ahead and grab your Bible, your leather-bound Bible. And if it's your phone, grab your phone and hold it close to your heart. And let's honor the Word of God. Father, we love your Word. You, Jesus is the Word. So if we say we love Jesus, then we're going to love the Word and what you have to say to us. We honor the Word. We decide right now that we're going to plant this Word in our heart, and it will produce 30, 60, and 100-fold as we heed to it, as we listen to it, and as we obey it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Back in August, I wrote, this is my God Speaks to Me journal, and when I get in the presence of the Lord in the morning, I sit there with my coffee, and then I'm quiet. And if the Lord has something to say to me, I write it down. I don't write what I have to say to the Lord down, like, oh, Lord, I want you to bless me, or, <laughs> or I want you to, you know, set my husband straight or you know no i'm going to this is what god this is god speaking to me and these two words in august is this is i wrote these two words stand and stay stay and stand actually and i remember when i when i wrote those down i thought i thought well i ain't going anywhere stay you know, some things are non-negotiable. Church is non-negotiable. My husband's non-negotiable. My family's non-negotiable. My job is non-negotiable. Where am I going, Lord? Stay. And stand. I wasn't really going through a battle. You know, nothing was, you know, no crisis was going on at that moment. <laughs> Many times God will give you something because the Bible says the Holy Spirit shows us things to come. He'll give you a word and you got to just hang on to that and then You'll remember that when you're faced with the situation. As a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, I remember, Lord, why are you giving me this? This is a little sidetrack. I wrote this down, and he said, don't deny your feelings or lie about your feelings. Just don't let the feelings or lack of feelings direct you, decide for you, dominate you, or dictate your lifestyle. Let God's word lead you and dominate you and dictate your lifestyle. I'm telling you that, and I was like, well, Lord, I ain't feeling nothing right now. Well, I'm telling you what, a couple days later, I had some feelings. I had some feelings like I didn't want to, I wanted to run. You know, I'm not saying for my husband or anything, but, you know, sometimes I got up the other day, I wasn't even up two hours. And I thought, Lord, I just want to go back to bed and sleep this day away and start over in the morning. Has anybody ever had that happen? But, you know, you can't do that. That's not, that's not faith. That's, that's not a victory mentality. That's not being more than a conqueror. That's being defeated. So I realized, okay, Lord, I've got these feelings going on. You know, I, can't, I, cannot, I cannot yield to them. So anyway, so he said, stay close to my word. Stay in faith. 
stay in the spirit. These are the things I needed to stay in. Stay sensitive to my voice. Stay in love. Stay faithful and stay committed. I thought, okay, Lord, I, those are some things that I'm going to work on staying in. He said, don't move away from my word or my presence or what I've called you to do. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Because, you know, even as Christians, I don't, I've been walking with God for, let's see, what is this year? I've been walking with God for 35 years. And I can still, if I'm not careful, I can still get flaky, wishy-washy, goofy. That's why he's saying, stay with my word. Stay with my spirit. Stay faithful. Stay committed. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. This word means unwavering, loyal, persistent. That's why when you get married, you stand before your husband and you say, in sickness and in health, for rich or for poor, for better or for worse, I'm sticking with you, baby. You know, as long as he wants to stick with me too. You know, now if he didn't want to stick with me, I don't have any choice over that. But that's my resolve. That's my steadfastness. Now my husband does want to stay with me, so don't Go off and think that. Unwavering, loyal, persistent. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Be unwavering. James calls a wavering mind a double-minded man. To, really, to doubt means to be of two minds. That's, and what James says is when you're a doubter, you are like the waves of the sea that's tossed to and fro. One minute you're believing God, and this is the will of God. And the next minute, no, this is the will of God. No, this, what, no. And the, he says a man who is double-minded, who is of two minds, will not receive anything from the Lord. So you've got to get fixed, get situated, Get firm and don't move off of that. The enemy's life goal is to knock you off your stand. And what God told you is yours, who he told you you are, what he's given you. His life goal is to come and knock you off of that. And you have to get some grit about your life. So he said, stand strong, stand tall, stand firm, stand confident, stand in the evil day, stand protected. So the title of the word this morning is stay connected and stand protected. Go with me to Psalm 1, verse 1. This is one of the first scriptures that I memorized when... I was a baby Christian, and I'm so thankful. Because, you, well, you know, when I got saved, I was raised Catholic. I didn't know anything. My dad said, two, two days after I got saved, I was reading the Bible. You know, saved people read their Bible. I never read my Bible in my life for 18 years. And then I got saved, and I wanted to read my Bible. He said, what are you reading? What are you reading? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> he said, the Old Testament or the New Testament? I said, what's the difference? I didn't even know. I was raised Catholic. I was baptized, confirmed, consecrated, dedicated, whatever that, whatever that is, first confession, first communion. I was religious, but I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I never even opened my Bible. But when I got saved, I did. So I'm thankful for this verse because in, in being a baby Christian, I realized, man, I gotta, I gotta get the word in me. I gotta renew my mind. I don't know anything about this new life in Christ. And that's how we learn about it, is we get in the word. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. You wanna be blessed? You better watch who you're hanging around with. Because you're not gonna be blessed hanging around the counsel of ungodly. Going to places where a bunch of ungodly people flock and act ungodly and talk ungodly. 
you will, that blessing will lift right off your life really, really quickly unless you're going there to tell somebody about what has taken place in your life and what's happening in your life. Well, I'm just going to be a light shining in the darkness. You better be careful because if you're not strong enough, bad company corrupts good moral and you're going to be going right down in there acting all worldly with them. Be careful. Blessed is the man that stands not in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, God didn't want us, he, he wants us in the word. To be in the word means I, I'm surrounded. I've got the word surrounding me on all directions. In Proverbs 4, it says, son, daughter, attend to my words. Let them not depart from your sight. Let them not depart from your ears. Keep them in the midst of your sight. You know, hold them in your heart. That's being in the Word. That's, that's how we, you've got to be in the Word. The Word's got to be surrounding you on all directions. I've been walking with God for 35 years, but we were, John and I were just talking about that at the membership class. If, if I don't get in the Word and I don't surround my people with great people of faith and encouragement and positive attitudes, I'm going down. I don't, I don't care what anybody says when they say they don't, you know, they don't need the body or they don't need a church or they don't need to be in the Word every day. There, there is a pull that this world is it's pulling on. It's just because we live in this world, you know, we're not of this world. But being in this world is a constant pressure and a constant pull to be conformed to this world. I'll tell you, I don't want, this world is not anything that I want to be conformed to. So, anyway, we got to go on. So we get in the Word. He shall be. So when we're in the Word, when we're planted in the Word, when the Word is my strength, and the Word is my song, and the Word is my light, and the Word is my source, and the Word is my confidence, and the Word is my answer, I will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does, he will prosper. Amen. You want prosperity? You want success? Starts right here in the river. Stay connected to the river. That's why we were singing that. Well, they were playing that song when Brody and Josh were doing their announcements. And I know I wasn't even listening to their announcement because I was listening to that song because I love that song. We're going down by the river, down by the river, down by the river to pray, down by the river, down by the river, never to be the same, down by the I'm telling you, that's what the river does. It'll change you. It's, it's the, and I'm talking about stay connected to the river. It's the word. It's the word. The river may be your church. The river may be the spirit of God. The river may be your marriage. But stay connected. Amen. So if you want to be blessed and you want to live a fruitful life and you want to prosper in what you do, plant yourself. Plant yourself. Plant yourself by the river. You may think, well, I, I, I'm planted. I'm planted. Well, if you're planted, you can't be uprooted. What is the river? The word, the church, the flow, the move, the love. Jesus says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke of the Spirit. But the, the, the verse before that, he says, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink. I believe that you are here because there's something in you that says there's more. There's something in you. The Bible says that God placed eternity in the hearts of men. Why do people come to church and worship a God and sing to a God that, that they can't see? Because there's an eternity that is in every single man, woman, boy, and girl that draws them to seek him, to seek an answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our river. Amen? You don't get rivers flowing out of you until you get connected to the river on the inside of you. And that river, he says, he spoke of the Spirit. Go to Psalm 92, verse 13. So, you know, I think... Uh, and being in, in uh, Pastor Todd and Daphne's church this weekend, it was just really exciting. It's always fun to go to other people's churches. And um, one of the things that uh, Miss Daphne said, 
She says, our people are so hungry. She said, they'll hear a message. Pastor Todd will teach a message, or a guest will come in and teach a message, and they just go back, and they keep watching it over and over and over again. I said, that's hungry, because when you're hungry, you're going to keep going back for some food that satisfied you, right? I teach that every time I t- think about our women's advance. I think, you know, you think, man, I just got a good sermon this Sunday morning. Praise God, that's going to carry me through till Wednesday or Thursday. But I'm telling you what, if you're really hungry, just like when you eat a steak and baked potato at 7 o'clock Sunday night on Monday morning, you wake up and you think, man, I'm hungry. I got to eat again. That's what happens when we get hungry for the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the move of God is you're satisfied for a moment, but that doesn't satisfy you. That's why in Psalm it says, habitually meditates on the Word day and night. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll kind of get a little addiction going on with God when you really, really get into in, into this river and this flow and, and you can't go days anymore without talking to him and you can't go days without reading his word it's just you just you can't you can't do that thank you thank you lord so psalm ninety two thirteen: those who are planted in the house of the lord shall flourish in the courts of their god that word flourish means to succeed to be healthy and to grow. You need to be planted in the house of the Lord. I was thinking just this morning how thankful I am for a church body because last week, if you remember, we had three people in the hospital. We had one gentleman who, and he's doing very well, he had brain surgery. Thank God he's home, he's walking around, he's recovering, hallelujah. We're praying for him as a church family. And then we have another a young woman. She's here this morning. She was pregnant. And they had to take her into ICU because the baby's heart went crazy. And they were concerned she was going to lose the baby. And then they were telling her, we're going to have to fly you to Houston. And the parents are saying, no. The daughter's saying, no, in the name of Jesus. This baby's heart's coming down. My heart's going to stay normal. And we're going to get out of this hospital. And we agree with that. She's here today. And then we have your little baby, Andy where the doctors kept telling her there's something wrong with your baby. She's too little. She's not growing. She's not measuring right. And pastor gave him a word even before the doctor started saying that. Everything's going to be okay. They took that baby this week. She was a healthy baby. Ain't nothing wrong with that baby. No, she wasn't small or nothing. Thank God you got family surrounding you in faith. Amen. So thankful for it. I'm thankful that we can be planted and growing. I'm thankful for you that you're hungry and you're thirsty and you want to move with God and you want to move with the Spirit and you're not satisfied to stay, stay the same. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, to flourish, to succeed, to be healthy. And when I think about being planted, stay connected, stay planted, I think of being go, digging digging down deep and planting a tree or planting my flowers and you plant them deliberately you just don't throw a tree out in your front yard and hope that it plants takes root no it's it's deliberately and purposefully planted god has deliberately and purposefully planted you first in his family and secondly in his body for a specific purpose and a specific work, a specific ministry. And it's up to us to discover that. And we're discovering it and walking it out the whole rest of our lives. Every one of you has a supply to bring. And that's why the devil does his hardest to make you feel you're insignificant, you're not needed, nobody cares, nobody sees, that your gift is so minuscule. Don't listen to that. A digging down deep, being placed purposefully and being yoked to God in the Holy Spirit. And when I was thinking about that being yoked to God, do you know, back in, I guess in the Old Testament or whenever, whenever they uh, yoked two oxen together, they put a strong oxen with a weak oxen. Because then there wasn't two heads or two strongs, you know, trying to go their own way. That's why the Bible tells us that we need to be yoked to God because who's the stronger one in that relationship him you are yoked to something 
Somebody's leading you, it might be you, it might be somebody else, but every one of us is yoked to something in life. Something's driving us, something's leading us. Find out what that is and stay there. To yoke, really, two means to yield. You know when the body says, don't yield your members, don't yield your members to the flesh and obey your flesh, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, yield yourself to God to obey his desire for your life. That's a choice, and to yield means I'm giving you the right of way, Holy Spirit. It's like you're driving, you know, and you've got a yield sign. You know what you do? Is anybody coming? You're letting them have the right of way. You're letting God have his right of way in your life. You're letting him make decisions. When I got saved, I immediately learned about the Lordship of Jesus. He's Lord of my life. I was saved a Baptist. And I'm so thankful for my Baptist upbringing. And I'm, so, I'm thankful because it wasn't just about, I got a Savior now and I'm going to heaven. You know, it was, I got a Lord and he's on the Lord of my life. And he calls my shots for me now. And I got to check in with him before I make decisions. What would Jesus do? You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Stay. Stay connected, rooted, fixed, always abounding. Let me tell you a little story here. It's a little history story. Back in 1763, a town was established along the Mississippi River, and it became a very prosperous and prominent city. And Thomas Calvin actually bought the city and renamed it to Rodney, Mississippi. Has anybody ever heard of Rodney, Mississippi? I never had either. Don't forget that. <laughs> by the mid, by the late 1700s, factories and schools and restaurants were going up. And in the 1800s, cotton was discovered. Agricultural prosperity was happening. And actually, uh, Rodney missed being the capital of Mississippi in, uh, in, this, in this century by three votes. That's how prosperous Rodney was. Well, something happened. The city was built along the river. And then the river began to change courses. And over many years, and by the early 1900s, the 1900s, Rodney was three miles off the river. I wonder what it did to the city. The town became a ghost town. There's no activity. To this day, there's one road in, and there's one road out. Point. No matter how many great things you have done or you have going for you, if the river ever leaves you or if you leave the river, you wither. And there'll be really no memory of you except what's written in an encyclopedia. We got to go with the flow, stay connected to the river, move with the river. Now, you Google this. Why did the river change directions? Engineers said it was because there was debris built up, started building up, what they call silt, I guess, and uh, just uh, like a, it wasn't really, a, it was a corrosion. It's kind of like, you're a nurse, when you have arteriosclerosis or something, hardening of the arteries, there's a calcium built up that gets in your arteries, the built up began to take place in the river. And so it pushed the river away. And that's what happens to us as Christians if we don't let the river wash us. We allow hardness of heart, bitterness, offense, disagreement, discouragements, disillusionment, dreams that never happen. We allow those to build up in our heart. And so it's not the river's choice to move, but we end up quenching the Holy Spirit, quenching the river. And so it begins to go this way. And if we don't repent and we don't allow that silt and that debris to be removed from our lives, attitudes, works of the flesh, angers, addictions, just anything that's just not godly. If you don't deal with it, it'll start building up and it'll push the river away. That's why the Bible says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Quench means to put, it, put them out. Don't put them out of your life. Don't move them out of your life because you're not willing to humble yourself. You're not willing to let it go. You're not willing to move past it. You're not willing to trust God. Don't, don't do that. Before you know it, your life is going to be off the river. And then 
there's not going to be much prosperity or blessing or spiritual activity. We've always heard it said, talked about the currents of this world that are pulling us. Well, if you're in the river, there's a current to the river. And that river's what, what restrains you when you want to go out and do, play, do things, go places, say, say things that aren't godly. That river, if you're, that's going to pull you. Stay in the river. The love of God constrains us. The goodness of God constrains us. The mercy of God constrains us. It's called the draw. It's called the draw of the Holy Ghost. Look at these two scriptures. The Holy Spirit has a draw. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up on the last day. I pray that. I pray that when I'm praying for people who are backslidden or people that don't even know Jesus yet, I say, God, draw them to yourself. You said people can't even come to you unless you draw them. You know, the Bible says he first loved us. We didn't love him first. He first loved us. And then John 12, 32 says, And if I be lifted up from heaven, I will draw all men unto me. Draw. The Bible says draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The rivers have a current and a draw. When you stay in the river, you're going to be quick to repent. You're going to be quick to come. You're going to be quick to come and, and receive cleansing and receive forgiveness and let some of those things go. You know, the Bible says, don't let any root of bitterness spring forth out of you. Why? Because it will contaminate you and defile the whole body. That's, a, that's kind of sobering to me because not only will your life become a mess because you're not dealing with a bitterness, but you start defiling other people. Do you want that responsibility on you? I'll think about, when I think about that, Jonah was a prophet, but because Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, he didn't like those, he didn't want those people saved, he said, well, I'm not going to go to Nineveh, God, I'm just going to go to Tarshish. So he got on the boat, and on his way to Tarshish, the boat's fixing to go down. And the people on that boat are like, all right, somebody here ain't doing right. Who is it? And Jonah says, it's me. Throw me over. Because if I don't get thrown over, all y'all going down. And I don't want y'all, y'all's blood on my hands. So, keep clean. The Bible says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore to me the joy of my salvation. So the river helps us clean. That's part of that words in that song. That go down to the river. You know, it's, there's a washing and a cleansing. There ain't nothing like being clean. I have to be clean every night when I go to bed. My feet have to be clean. If not, ooh, it's just, I can't go to sleep. Can't live. It's just, Lord, be clean, be clean. Amen. Okay, now let, and this, number two, this is the second part, and we'll finish up. So God told me, stay, stay connected to the river. Number two, stand, stand protected. Stand protected. Our whole Christian life, we are contending for the faith. Go to Jude 3. While you're turning there, you know the word contend means to oppose. It means to resist. And you're opposing and you're resisting. The Bible says, you know, resist the devil and he will flee. You're opposing and you're resisting anything that's coming against your nature, coming against your call, coming against the promises of God. You, you have to resist it and you have to oppose it. The other day I got up out of bed and I was walking to get my coffee and I was walking down my hall and it's amazing when something happens to you, it, it, it kind of stops you in your tracks. It was like I didn't see with my physical eyes but I saw with my spirit. As I was walking down my hall, my, my front door was right here. I was walking down my hall and it was like there were two huge giants. I mean they were like ready to get in my door. And as, I, as, I, as all this is, I'm seeing this in my spirit, I'm sitting here thinking, all right, they're at my door. Well, they don't have to come in. I could let them in. 
by giving over to anxiety, giving over to worry, feeling overwhelmed and caught in an attitude because my days aren't going the way I want to and I'm being interrupted with this and I'm being interrupted with that. And you know, I, I could give into that and as soon as I give into that, those giants are in me and they're on top of me. Or I could just keep walking and say, you ain't coming in. In the name of Jesus, I choose you, Lord. I choose peace. I choose the peace of God to garrison my mind. You know, it's your choice. But the whole, your whole life, you're contending for the faith. Just when you think, ooh, I've got some breathing room, there'll be something else that you're having to contend for. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. When the giants of my to-do list and needs becomes bigger than what I have in me and what God promised me, then I give in to the giants. And I just sold my victory. Go to Ephesians 6. So I'm talking about stand protected. Stay planted and stand protected. In this scripture, this is the last, the last passage in Ephesians. And Paul said, finally, finally, after everything I've told you, up to Ephesians 5, 31, remember this. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Everybody say, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In this passage, four times, Paul's telling you to stand. You're going to have to stand. Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may, able to, you may be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Okay, what did he say? Put on the armor of God. And then go into verse 13. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. What's the evil day? The day of temptation, the day of testing, and the day of trial. You need to know how to stand in that day. It comes to all of us. And having done all, you stand. Verse 14, stand. He's telling you, you stand. Our armor is our covering. Our armor is our protection. Just like you put on that t-shirt, that jacket, those shoes, you put on the armor of God. Now, you don't have to say, okay, I'm putting on the belt of truth. I'm putting on my shoes of peace, putting on the breast. No, how you do that is what are you meditating on day and night? I thank you, Father, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I thank you, Father, that I stand worthy and blameless before you. I thank you, Father, I choose peace. I'm going to pursue peace with my sister. I'm going to pursue peace with my family. That's how you put on the armor. I thank you, Father, that you've given me the shield of faith that I can lift up and over all myself and quench every fiery dart. That's how you put on the armor. What are you doing day and night? Where's your mind going day and night? Amen? Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2 says, I will say of you, Lord, here it is, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. You are my God in whom I trust. How do you stand protected? In your refuge. Who is your refuge? Jesus. The Lord is my refuge and my strength. A very present help in time of trouble. He's your covering. When all hell is breaking loose, the Lord is a strong tower. Right? The righteous run into it and they're safe. You don't run to your buddy. You run to Jesus. Jesus, you got this. Jesus, you're for me. Jesus, that's how you run into your refuge. That's your safe place. That's how you stand protected. Back in the Old Testament, God told Moses, I want you to go build five cities, and they're called cities of refuge. Everybody say cities of refuge. And these cities of refuge were for those people who accidentally killed or murdered somebody. Now, I don't believe there's anybody in here, and if there was, well, I wouldn't look at you any different. That's actually murdered somebody. You know, but there's a city of refuge that if you murder somebody accidentally, you could run into it. And what that, what, what that meant was, as long as you were in the city, you were protected. Because there's what was called, in the blood of, you go look in this in the Old Testament, 
there's what was called a blood avenger. And if you killed one of my family members, even if it was an accident, I could come and kill you and take your life lawfully. And so if somebody accidentally killed somebody, then they, need, they could run to the city and they could be spared. They could stay at that city for as long as they wanted to and they were protected. That's called the city of refuge. Everybody say city of refuge. Now the one thing about that city was that not only could you enter it, if you so choose to, you could exit it. And what happens if you exited it? You became vulnerable to the blood avenger. And there was a story about Abner and uh, Joab in 2 Samuel. We won't go there for time's sake. In 2 Samuel uh, 2 and 3. And Abner actually killed Joab's brother. But Joab's brother was pursuing Abner. And, and Abner said, I, I forget his name, Asiel or Asael or whatever. Abner said, Asiel, stop pursuing me. Go kill somebody else. Because it was kind of like, I'm, I'm, I got you. You, ain't, you can't get me. If you try to kill me, I'm going to get you. So if you want your life spared, go kill somebody to the right or the left, but don't come after me. Well, he didn't listen. And so I still came after Abner, and Abner turned around and killed him. Well, a seal had a brother named Joab. He was part of David's army. And when Joab found that out, Joab became the blood avenger. And he went to pursue Abner. And in, in chapter 3, it talks about how Abner got into the city. And here comes Joab coming up to the gate. And it says that he spoke softly and he wooed Abner out of the city gates. And then he killed him. David wept over Abner. And he said he died a fool's death. Why did he die a fool's death? Because he didn't have to leave that city. And he listened to the subtleties and the woos of his enemy. Come on out of here. Come on out of here, Abner. You don't have to stay in there. We used to be friends. Come, come with me. And he died a fool's death. Once you get into that city of refuge and you've made him your refuge, you could get out. You can go back to what you used to be and used to do. But when you do, you're not protected anymore. And that's not to put fear in you at all. That's to say, stay in the city. Stay with what God provided you for your protection, for your provision, for your blessing. Amen. And then I'm going to close with this. How many of you remember the, the story of Cecil the lion? Remember that? Back in the summer, it was kind of a big story about the hunter, the American hunter ended up killing the lion over in Zimbabwe. Well, this will just take a second. But I never paid much attention to it until now. When uh, I found out that the hunter hired, the American hunter ended up hiring some locals to orchestrate this hunt for him. So he paid $50,000. He didn't care how they orchestrated it. Just, we want I want to kill a lion. So these locals took it, let me back up. Cecil was in a national park, and it was a refuge. You couldn't kill the lion as long as Cecil was in the national park. And all these lions that were in this national park in Africa, okay? That's where he was. He was 13 years old. Oxford University even had been uh, following him and doing studies on him. Okay? So these locals take a deer, kill the deer, start dripping all the blood on the vehicle to create a scent, and they drove through the National Forest. And what happens when Cecil the lion picks up the scent? What do you think? He follows it. And then they drive out of the National Forest, out of the refuge, and what do you think Cecil the Lion does? Follows him out of the 
refuge. The, as a matter of fact, when I was looking at this, it literally called the forest a sanctuary. Do you know what the word sanctuary means? Refuge. He left his refuge. He was shot with a bow, and then 40 hours later, he was killed with a rifle. I said that to tell you, don't leave your refuge. And if you're not even there yet, get there. It's called Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, your protection. The Bible says, with long life will I satisfy you and show me your salvation. I don't have to fear my kids losing their life early. Because he said, with long life, stay in the refuge and you'll have long life. But you get out of the refuge and you start following that sin. You start following the sin. You start following what you used to follow. Don't do that. People want to blame God for that. No, that was our choice. The Bible says you choose who you're going to serve today. You're, you choose if you're going to stay in the place of refuge. You choose where you're going to plant yourself. You choose. What are your choices today? Stand to your feet. I'm done. Is everybody happy? Is everybody okay? Are you stirred? Are you stirred? You know, as we grow in God, we don't mature all at once. It's like a baby. You know, a baby's parents nurture them and feed them and clothe them and, and get them to walk and get them to eat. And that's how God does us. He nurtures us and he walks with us. And when we fall and we mess up and we get into things we shouldn't, then he instructs us and disciplines us for our good. And you know, as Christians, there are things that we need to be done with. You know, he said, okay now, you know, you've, you, you've been childish for a long time. It's time to, let's move on into maturity. Let's, let's step it up. Let's graduate. Let's go to third grade. Let's go to sixth grade. Okay? We make those choices as we commit ourselves, as we plan ourselves, as we stay faithful to God. To close your eyes. I want to give an invitation. This is what I really have in my heart. That... There, there is some of you here, I, I know, I know as I was praying, that you may have you know, led a religious life. I was raised a Catholic for 18 years, never knew what it meant to be born again. Somebody told me I needed to receive Jesus. I needed to confess him with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead and then I'll be saved. And maybe you've never done that. You've never, you can't to the morning of December 21st, 1981. I was reading a track called My Heart Christ Home. And this is what I said. I didn't pray a floofy prayer. This is what I said. I said, Lord, I was hung over. I said, Lord, I've made a mess of my life. Can you do anything with me? I give you my life. Please forgive me. And I knew that when I put that Christ my, Christ my home, Heart Christ Home book down, and I stepped out of my bathtub. I was a new person. I didn't look different, and I still hadn't had a chance to act different, but I knew something was different in me. And that was the beginning of my Christian walk. So if you're here and you've never made that decision, will you say, Jesus, I choose you. I believe you love me, you died for me, you were raised for me. I choose you as my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. If you're ready to do that, right now I want you to lift your hand. Is there anybody here you'd say, I've never done that before. I see those two hands right there. Anybody else? You, 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 you've never done it. I'm talking, I'm fishing for first time salvations. The Bible says that he's translated us from the kingdom of darkness into his dear son Jesus. When does that translation happen? At the time you confess him as Lord.
begin to succeed and have purpose. If that's you, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Anybody here who says, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to come back. God's not given us a spirit of fear. But sometimes it's, it's so paramount. Because when you're not under the protection of God, I'm not saying if you just sin once, but when you literally are running from Him, out of here you stay here just a little while longer while you go sign up for the men's tool party tonight bring a 15 to 20 dollar wrapped gift for a gift exchange sign up to bring a food item you guys have a super blessed day ladies we'll see you friday at lunch you are dismissed bye-bye <laughs>